Hi, my name is Chris Cray. I'm a wildlife biologist with the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, and we're doing this presentation today because uh, most of you watching are probably aware that we've had an unusually high number of reported cases of <clears throat> hemorrhagic disease in our deer herd in western North Carolina. And that's what we're going to talk about here for a little bit. The talk that I've got put together is basically organized into three parts. We're going to start out talking about some basic information about the disease. Then we're going to change gears a little bit. We're going to talk about the specifics of this year's outbreak. And then we're going to kind of get to the tough question at the end, which is given all that information, what type of conclusions or recommendations would we make at this point? So let's start first with that basic information about the disease. Hemorrhagic disease is a virus that has likely been affecting white-tailed deer as long as there's been white-tailed deer. It is a viral disease. Uh, it occurs in our state every year, generally in fairly low numbers. The frequency and severity of the outbreaks of the disease really vary uh, not just from year to year, but also regionally within the state. It is a summertime and early fall disease. We tend to see those cases from July through October, so we're, we're kind of on the tail end of it here in September. And it's an important point to point out that uh, this disease is not a result of having an overpopulated deer herd. That seems to be a misconception that's out there, um, but that's not the case. There are two basic forms of hemorrhagic disease, two viruses family, if you will. One of those viruses is the blue tongue virus. That seems to be the, the name that folks uh, in the general public generally know. They've heard of blue tongue virus. The other major virus in that family is EHD, or epizootic hemorrhagic disease. And within each of these types, there's actually several different kinds. You know, there's a couple different serotypes of EHD, and there's several serotypes of the blue tongue virus as well. We've actually been able to get our hands on quite a few deer this year from Western North Carolina, and all of those have actually come back as being epizootic hemorrhagic disease serotype 2. So the, the terms are a little bit interchangeable between EHD and blue tongue, and in the field to a deer that's infected with that virus, the field signs and the way it progresses are very similar. That's basically a distinction that you would make in the laboratory as to which serotype it is. The virus is actually transmitted to the deer by a biting insect. Specifically, it's the biting flies in the genus Culicoides. Most folks don't know the name Culicoides, but they do know the name noceums or biting midges or sand gnats or something along those lines. That's what most folks would know that as. And that insect is the vector that's responsible for getting the virus to the deer. That's how the deer become infected is by that fly. Hemorrhagic disease is primarily, almost exclusively, a disease of the deer family. And it will, in fact, not just white-tailed deer, but mule deer, elk, uh, antelope can get it as well. So generally members of the deer family. Beyond that, there are just a couple of exceptions of other species that can be affected. Uh, principally, it would, could potentially be a problem with sheep. That's more with the blue tongue virus than with the EHD, which is what we have this year and uh, they can actually show clinical signs sometimes. Cattle, if you looked at their blood chemistry, that you could detect that they had been exposed to the disease, but you wouldn't really ever expect to see any clinical signs or uh, symptoms or deaths from it in, in cattle. So beyond that, uh, there's really no species that get it. So domestic pets, dogs, cats, you know, birds, humans, all those other species are not something that would be infected by hemorrhagic disease. Based on how the disease progresses in an animal, it it's becomes useful to categorize hemorrhagic disease into three different forms. And that's basically based on how rapidly the disease develops and what type of symptoms it presents. The paracute and acute forms are the quick-acting forms. The chronic form is sort of the longer-term, drawn-out form over a couple weeks or a couple months that, that might affect a deer. Most of what we've seen this year in 2012 has been the paracute and acute forms, very quick acting forms. 
you know, a deer that's being affected in this form of hemorrhagic disease, there might be a little bit of swelling in the head, neck type things, but most of the damage, if you will, is on the inside. Uh, lesions in the heart, lesions in the mouth and in the stomach that's causing the deer problem. Their behavior in the short term there is going to be a lot of inactivity, they're feverish, they're dehydrated, they're probably going to go to water, uh, a nice cool damp place where they're trying to rest up because the disease is hitting them so hard. Um, and generally speaking, when you, when you find a deer that has expired or has died from an acute form of the disease, that does, it looks actually at first glance, it looks very healthy. You know, the weight condition is good, the hair coat generally looks pretty good, but you're down by a creek or something and you basically just got a dead deer lying there. That's mostly what we've seen this year is that rapid acting form. Our hunters this fall may actually come across some deer that have been affected with the chronic form of the disease. And in that situation, um, the virus has not taken the animal down quickly. So there might be some lameness in their feet. They may have some stomach ulcers, but overall they're going to appear to be a sick deer. There's going to be some weight loss or emaciation. The hair coat might look kind of rough. In this category, a deer is obviously going to look sick. If they recover from that, which they oftentimes do from that chronic form, it's not 100% fatal, you may uh, notice on their hooves some irregular growth patterns. When that deer was affected and it was feverish and it was suffering from the disease, the growth of the outer covering of the hooves uh, gets interrupted and uh, as it regrows after the animal recovers, it'll leave some funny patterns there. Now, a couple points about animals that you might see that are subjected to this chronic form. Number one, if you see sick animals out there, there's not a need to try to take those out of the population. Having those animals out there is not perpetuating the disease. It's not making things worse for the, worse for the other healthy deer that are out there. So there's no need to try to take those out just because they're sick. They actually have a pretty decent chance of recovering, and we ought to give them the chance to do that. The second thing is hunters a lot of times have a question about whether or not a deer is safe to eat um, that they take during hunting season. And the answer to that is that the virus is not posing any additional risk to a hunter that's going to be eating a deer that they kill. You know, if they're killing a deer that looks healthy, it's got good weight and good hair coat, it's acting normally at the time that they take it, there's no reason not to just process and consume that deer as they normally would. The virus is not adding any additional risk. Um, to consumption, even if they were to, to notice some of those effects on the outer covering of the hoof. That's still not an indication that they, they need to not consume that animal. Hemorrhagic disease is primarily a disease of the southeastern United States, southeastern U.S. Um, and the further south and east you go, the more prevalent the disease becomes. Um, when you get down into South Georgia, the coastal plain of the Carolinas, you know, lower Alabama, those deer there are actually exposed to hemorrhagic disease almost on an annual basis. It's very frequent. And those deer consequently develop a considerable amount of immunity to, this, to hemorrhagic disease. So that actually in those areas, while you've got a high incidence of the disease, you actually have fairly low mortality rates. You know, generally it would be less than 5% is what you'd expect in the, in the true deep south there. Now, as you go further north and west, the disease becomes less frequent. Deer are not subjected to it or exposed to it on an annual basis. In fact, it may be five or 10 years between episodes of hemorrhagic disease. So consequently, the deer there don't have an opportunity to develop much immunity. And when you do get an outbreak, you tend to have considerably higher mortality rates. That really is the pattern that we seem to be following here in Western North Carolina this year. It's been a number of years in our mountain county since we've seen much hemorrhagic disease. And I, I think our deer there have not had much exposure to it for several years. The, there's three principal factors that affect how much of your deer herd you're going to lose uh, to a hemorrhagic disease outbreak. The first thing to consider is what we just talked about and, you know, has that herd been exposed to hemorrhagic disease in previous years, recent years? Um, in case in Western North Carolina is that our herd actually has very little immunity based on what's happened in the last few years. The second thing that comes into play is the particular strain of the virus that you have, and that can vary from year to year, much the same way that 
the flu kind of varies in, in humans every year. Some years are worse than others for, for flu. Um, the particular strain of the virus this year seems to be very strong. We're seeing mostly those acute cases where deer die just in a matter of one to two days versus the more cases of the chronic form where that virus is not quite so strong. The third thing that really comes into play is how abundant is that biting midge or those noceums that pass the virus to the deer. Uh, the abundance of that insect has a big role to play in how many deer are going to die in a disease outbreak. And it's hard to pinpoint exactly which weather conditions are the most important, but we had a, wild, a mild winter. We seem to have a really early spring. We had a lot of rainfall early, followed by some really hot conditions. And it's hard to know which of those uh, weather parameters were the most important, but it seems like we've got an abundance of that insect this year based on the local weather phenomenon there in Western North Carolina. Okay, that's a quick summary of a pretty complex disease talking about just the basic information of hemorrhagic disease. So if we change gears a little bit, uh, we'll move on now and, and talk about the specifics of what we know for Western North Carolina this year. You know, what's, what's going on in Western North Carolina? And I've referred several times to Western North Carolina, but it's important to kind of define that a little bit. In our agency, operates um, organized based on nine wildlife districts across the state. And when I say the mountain region, I'm talking about districts seven, eight, and nine. And that's what we're going to zoom in on here for a few minutes is districts, the western part of the state, districts seven, eight, and nine. And it became evident in um, early July that we were getting a lot of reports of hemorrhagic disease cases. Uh, field signs were very consistent with the disease. So obviously we track those reports as a way to gauge you know where is the disease occurring and how bad might it be um, and if we look to the map there you know we'll see that most counties have at least a, a couple cases in them but then there's a couple counties that really jump out in particular you know you notice that um, there's really high numbers in in Surrey County there with over a hundred reports uh, Wilkes County's got well over a hundred reports and so does Caldwell County now, and so that start, stuff starts jumping out off the map to you. But it's important to remember that, you know, reporting rates from the public are not consistent in all areas. In some, place, some places, uh, deer are not as visible, so there's fewer of them found to be reported. Um, and, of course, the severity of the disease kind of varies from one place to another t as well. So we don't look at that map as a, as a total estimate of total mortality where we've counted every deer that's died, but that's just an indication that we need to take a little closer look at what's going on. And we can begin to explain this map of where that's occurring if we consider where the Blue Ridge Escarpment is in Western North Carolina. And if you see the yellow line there, that bas basically represents the point, um, you know, down from the Virginia border you know, all the way down through the state where you basically transition from the foothills into the high mountain counties. And most of those areas that are really getting high numbers of reports are basically just on the eastern side of that in what you would really call the, the heart of the foothills. You know, northwestern Surrey County, the northern part of Wilkes County, and then down into the northern part of Caldwell County is where that's where those calls are really coming from. So that's the area that we take this reported information and, and the next step then is to take a closer look in the field to try to verify what's going on and verify how bad the mortality impact might be. So in the northwestern part of the state there, we actually went to 13 different places in that sort of that primary zone of where the impact seems to be and really got out there on some creeks, on some waterways, counting carcasses and counting dead deer that we found uh, to put a better handle on what's going on with this disease. And just to kind of give you a feel for how this worked, you know, one of the areas that we went is what's captured on this topo map here on Thurman Chatham game lands. And if you look there, we've got, um, we've got about a mile of Richardson branch that we surveyed from a, a start point to a stop point and walked down through there. We counted, um, every dead deer we could find basically and this was one of the few places that we actually went and didn't find any dead deer from the disease but if we think about what does that one mile of stream represent you know we can kind of go back to that map and 
basically draw out the watershed effect around that area. So we know we've got one mile of stream there with, in this case, zero deer on it. But we also know that that represents uh, about 250 acres or so of the closest water that if a deer is suffering from the disease, that's likely the, the water they're going to go to. So it, it begins to get us in the ballpark of trying to grasp how much mortality we've actually had. Um, and like I mentioned just a few minutes ago, we, we searched 13 different areas. That totaled up 18 miles of creeks that we actually looked at. If we consider that watershed effect, that, that, those creeks represented about 4,000, a little over 4,000 acres of habitat. We spent 91 man hours actually searching that. And in total, we found 80 dead deer on those 18 miles of creek. So what do we do with those numbers? You know, how, what does that tell us about the population? Uh, about the impact of the disease. Well, um, we kind of need to break that down in some averages to try to make it meaningful. And on average, that means that we found for every hour that we searched, we found just a little bit less than one deer per hour. So about 0.9 deer per hour of searching. Uh, it works out to four and a half deer per stream mile of what we looked at. And if you consider how many acres we were roughly searching, you know, that works out to about 12 and a half mortalities per square mile of habitat out there. Okay, so we, we've got to try to grasp that uh, and try to put that in perspective for what that means to the deer herd. And there's a couple ways to do that. Um, you know, if we, we think about those numbers from the survey, four and a half deer per mile, 12.4 12 deer per square mile, we can also look at the average mortality that we see from a typical hunting season. And if we look at that both from a reported harvest and also factor in how much non-reported harvest uh, we estimate goes on as well, we come up with a number for Wilkes County of about 9.7 deer per square mile. And in Surrey County, that works out to about 6.8 deer per square mile, roughly is what the mortality from the hunting season would be. And that's an average over the, each of the last three years that we would look at. Um, the other way to consider sort of the impact of this mortality is to think about, you know, what we feel like the starting population in these areas was. And in uh, Wilkes County, you know, our best estimate of population density is that there's roughly 45 deer per square mile in most of the county. In Surrey County, it's a little bit lower, you know, and our best estimate there is that we're at around 30 deer per square mile. So we've got all these numbers to try to consider this disease impact, but I want to really caution folks that will be looking at these numbers, you know, be very careful about interpreting them. Directly comparing them is, is really an apples to orange comparison. In fact, it's not just apples to orange, but it's apples to oranges to bananas because we've got three things there. You know, we've got one number that's derived from an estimate of how many deer we think we started with. We've got another number that's derived from hunting harvest and an estimate of non-reported harvest. And then we've got a third number there that's derived from actual boots on the ground counting deer. So those are, even though they're kind of in the same units, so to speak, we need to be real cautious about interpreting those together. Uh, we're making, making uh, a leap from those numbers. Another way to consider this disease impact, uh, impact of the disease mortality is to consider how this is going to affect our hunter harvest this fall. And, you know, we're into the bow season now in northwestern part of the state, so we can actually look at some of those numbers. And what I pulled up for this presentation was actually the deer harvest during the first seven days of the archery season this year compared to the deer harvest during the first seven days of the archery season for the last couple years. And when we take a close look at that, we see that in Wilkes County and Surrey County, you know, there's been a pretty big drop in the early season archery harvest this year compared to the average over each of the last couple of years. So in other words, just to walk through the numbers a little bit, in Wilkes County, um, each of the last three years, you know, we were seeing on average about 81 deer being reported each year. In 2012, this year, during that same first seven days of the season, you know, we only saw 35 deer being reported. So that means that there was a drop of 57% in the harvest early in the season. Keep in mind, there's a lot of things that can affect that. You know, one can be the disease mortality. That's obviously one factor. 
but that's a fairly short time period. Weather can come into play. You know, if it's hot, folks are going to hunt less and if the weather's favorable. And we seem to have a real abundance of mass, hard mass crop this year. Our acorn production seems to be really high. So all those things, you know, food sources come into play too. So all those things can affect those numbers. But it does seem to be an indication that, that the harvest is going to be way down in those areas this year. We've covered two of the three parts for this talk. Um, we've gone over basic information about the disease. We've talked about the specifics of this year's outbreak as best we can. You know, there's a lot we know, there's a lot we don't know. But taking all this information and moving forward to the next step to think about, you know, what we do, do we conclude or recommend from that, that's the difficult part to get into, but that's kind of the third part of this talk. So moving on to talk about the conclusions and recommendations. Well, the first conclusion I think is a fairly straightforward one to make folks aware of is that while this disease, disease mortality is really widespread, the impacts of the disease are greatest right on the east slope of the Blue Ridge Escarpment and the foothills. So, you know, the places I'm talking about in that are, you know, northwestern Surrey County, northern Wilkes County, uh, and northern Caldwell County, somewhat down into Burke and McDowell counties down in here. Um, on the map that would be down into this area, but you know that that basic zone is right along the eastern side of the Blue Ridge Escarpment. So folks that have hunt clubs or hunt on property there or farm in those areas, you know those are the areas that are the most affected by the disease this year. Yes, it is prevalent in, in many other counties. Folks may actually have a little hot spot where they you know found a fair number of deer that have died from it, but the overall impact is going to be much less in those surrounding counties and other areas than it is right in that zone along the escarpment. The second conclusion is, is maybe a little bit harder to make, and that is what is the exact mortality percentage of this disease outbreak? That's a really hard thing to put your finger on, and I hesitate to try to put a number on it. You know, we talked earlier about the surveys that we did, plus the reports that we looked at, you know, plus what we thought was there in terms of deer herd to start with, and it, it's hard to quantify that. But in general, if you look throughout the southeast at other places that have had severe, you know, what would be called a severe disease outbreak, they're generally, uh, you know, research has shown after the fact that generally those places are looking at mortality rates in the 30 to 50 percent range. And while I don't know that that's the exact figure you, that we have here, it seems likely based on our work that we're probably in that same ballpark. That's going to obviously vary a little bit depending on how close you are to that primary zone, if you will, where it seems to be the hardest. You know, as you come away from that, probably the mortality rate is a little bit less. But you know, we're probably somewhere uh, you know, in a similar ballpark as what's happened in severe outbreaks in other states. That seems to be the case. Now, um, the bad thing about, is, about that is that that's a big mortality impact on your deer herd. The good thing about that in, or the good thing about our part of the state for that is that there's a lot of reason to be optimistic about our deer herd's ability to rebound from that. You know, one thing going directly this year is a, just a real abundance of natural food sources this fall. You know, we've got a really good hard mass production and soft mass production of grapes and some other things that are out there, they're important deer foods. So the deer that are out there, you know, I expect them to go into the wintertime um, in really good shape. And we're talking about a part of the state where we started with a really robust, healthy deer population to start with. And we've got a landscape that's conducive to, uh, to fostering a good deer herd. So we've got, you know, basically all the basic pieces to be very optimistic for a quick rebound of the deer herd. You know, it's hard to put a number on how quick that might be. Um, but hemorrhagic disease is not a disease that's ever been shown to uh, knock a deer herd back so much that it couldn't recover. You know, that's never been the case in other places and other times that it's occurred. We talked a few minutes ago about, you know, the comparison of this disease mortality to mortality from the hunting season. And, you know, kind of some of the numbers there point toward the mortality from the disease probably being, you know, one or perhaps as much as two times more than the mortality we'd expect during a regular hunting season. And that's, again, that's a pretty big impact. But we also need to consider in terms of regulations and stuff that, uh, 
that effect is probably largely going to be compensated by the fact that hunters in the area are aware that this is going on. Uh, you know, they know we've had this big disease hit this year, and I think they're going to have less desire to harvest deer from their areas. Most of the folks that I talk to, by and large, the vast majority of them, that's the opinion that they've expressed is that, you know, they're going to voluntarily reduce uh, the number of deer that they take off their, their land this year. The other side of the coin, too, is even if they didn't want to do that voluntarily, you know, with fewer deer out there, there's just going to simply be less opportunity to harvest those deer. So we do expect a pretty, pretty substantial drop in the harvest this year. And that kind of brings us to the question about, you know, regulatory changes that might be um, appropriate in this situation. There's, there's certainly been a lot of questions about closing the deer season this year or, or adjusting the regulations for, for this year. And there are no plans to do that for 2012. There's, there's not any uh, plans to change either the calendar dates or the bag limits or anything like that for 2012. And we kind of got to step back from that and think about it a little bit because we don't really have a truly a complete picture of the deer harvest, or excuse me, of the mortality from this disease yet. We're still kind of in it, uh, so to speak. We're hopefully on the tail end of the disease now, but a couple things that have to happen this fall to get a complete picture of the disease is going to be to continue to evaluate the hunter harvest like we were doing a little bit, to continue to evaluate the sex and age, age ratios of the herd, both of the sex and age ratio of what the disease has hit and also the sex and age ratios of the, um, of the hunter harvest as well. And, you know, we're going to continue to document reports of mortality because we're still getting a few cases now. It seems to be uh, that we might be on the tail end of this, but we're still getting a few reports coming in. With that said, though, you know, that we're talking specifically about 2012 with no changes, but it may be that after this hunting season's wrapped up and we feel like we have a complete picture of the mortality event, that it may be, it may be appropriate in future years to make some changes in our hunting. So folks sort of need to be aware that that's a, that's a possibility on the horizon, so to speak. A final conclusion or recommendation that, that I'd make pretty strongly to folks that might be either individual property owners or a you know, member of a hunt club that's in that primary zone where the disease is hitting hardest, um, they really need to be aware that a significant mortality event has occurred. And, you know, if they've got specific goals for their property, maybe an age structure or numbers of deer, you know, they might need to adjust their harvest accordingly. Sort of depends on their objectives, what type of adjustment they might make. Uh, but they need to be aware that it's going on. And as an example of that, you know, I want to show a few pictures. Uh, you know, we're here in late September. A lot of this mortality occurred, you know, in June and July and the beginning of August. Um, and the evidence of that actually, actually goes away pretty quickly. The picture here is of a deer that died in northern Wilkes County around Trap Hill um, in early August. And this picture was taken pretty much the, the day that deer died. If it wasn't the day it died, it was very, very quickly the following day. We're not exactly sure when it died, but it was at most one day old. Now, when you come back to that exact same deer three days later, the rate of decomposition is really just astounding. When we're talking about 100 degree temperatures in the middle of the summer, these, these carcasses decompose really quickly. And then as a final picture, coming back again to the exact same deer 30 days after it was dead, there's almost nothing left. So if you've not been out on your property uh, throughout the course of the summer, you know, perhaps you, you don't maybe even live in that area, but you, you just come up to hunt or something, be aware that this has happened and it's kind of hard to see now. You could very easily walk by those skeletal remains and not realize they were there. So just be aware that that has gone on this, this summer. I think we covered a lot of ground here in a fairly short amount of time. You know, we talked about the basic information of the disease. We talked about the specifics of this year's outbreak, and we went through some of the basic conclusions and recommendations. Um, this is obviously a big topic. It's really been important to folks. We're getting a lot of questions about it, and I hope you'll continue to uh, look to our website if you've got questions or to try to find more information out about this hemorrhagic disease outbreak that we've seen this year.